Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Catalina Gillies. Thunder Bay Police Chief Sylvie Hoth is calling for a revamped officer's deployment model in an effort to reimagine the city's police response to rising drug activity. The proposal came this morning as the Police Services Board met virtually for the final time in 2021. The ongoing drug trade in Thunder Bay continues to put pressure on local police. Hoth says more officers are needed to keep up with an incredibly active drug trade and gang activity in the city. The bail process was one of her greatest concerns as people released on conditions to not return to Thunder Bay often re-entered the community anyway. Hoth says this continuous cycle is creating a major strain on the force. There has to be some changes in terms of either the bail process or more stringent conditions or something done to the system so that we are better served as a community. Um, my comment to you was that we can't keep up because it is a revolving circle where we charge, we arrest, get released and start again. So it is frustrating from a policing standpoint to do so continually. I'm just thinking that it might be an issue that as a board, we might want to spend a bit of time on and through resolution potentially uh, bring our own voice to bear on, on what we might want to see when it comes to bail reform. Hoth also noticed the city police force is significantly underfunded for the size of the population they serve. Thunder Bay Police responded to 51,000 calls between January and November of this year, and only 20% of those were related to the criminal code. A Toronto man is now under arrest after a Thunder Bay police cruiser was rammed early Sunday morning following a confrontation with police. The two officers have observed a suspicious vehicle and later discovered that the driver had been ordered not to operate a vehicle. The 25-year-old suspect then attempted to flee, hitting the police cruiser and narrowly avoiding the officers. He was arrested today and charged with resisting arrest, dangerous driving and two counts of assaulting a peace officer with a weapon. A new strategy to address homelessness in Thunder Bay has been approved by City Council. The strategy focuses on three goals, leveraging outside funding, enhancing in-house funding, and providing more advocacy for local organizations. Also last night, Council approved a dividend increase from T-Bay Tell. Corey Nordstrom has more. Yes. Okay, Council, that is carried. The new homelessness strategy was passed unanimously by City Council. Among its plans to leverage outside funding, provide more in-house funding, and further the city's advocacy. You know, I really see the, the city as, as an agent of um, great help and, and, and facilitation uh, for all these wonderful groups that are doing work in this area. Um, and and we, can, we can assist. Um, and that's all we really want to do. We want to assist. The details of the report include asking administration to locate financing to increase the Community Partnership Reserve Fund to $1 million, with $300,000 needed annually in future years. Additionally, the strategy would increase eligibility for housing projects like the recently proposed Tiny Homes Project. While Council was in favour of doing more for the homeless community, some were concerned about the possible impacts on the budget. How are we going to pay for all this? And we have to be very understanding of that, that, you know, our tax situation in the city of Thunder Bay, you know, it's, it's high. We are anticipating a, a um, favourable variance at the end of 2021. So there is the opportunity to allocate some potential funding from the 2021 positive variance as well as Renew Thunder Bay. Gaps in service were also highlighted in the strategy, with administration noting the need for low barrier shelter spaces and youth specific shelters. City staffers well versed in the funds know the return on investment is high. Every dollar the city puts in results in $7 worth of other revenue. Split between uh, $1.40 in funding from other levels of government, and $5.60 in earned and fundraised revenue that those organizations are bringing in. In other council business, a change to the t -Tel dividend was unanimously passed. The city will receive $18 million a year from the telecommunications company until 2023, then see a half million dollar increase the following year, and by 2025, $18.75 million. Corey Nordstrom, TBT News. 
The city of Kenora has declared a state of emergency due to the recent spike in COVID-19 cases in that community. The Northwestern Health Unit reported 26 new cases in the Kenora area over the weekend. The state of emergency is meant to help secure additional resources from the province. And Kenora residents are being urged to stay home as much as possible to help stop the spread. The NWHU announced 12 cases today and the active case count in the catchment area dropped from 117 to 102. Just two of the new cases are in Kenora, three are in Dryden, two are in Sioux Lookout and two are in Emo. Port Francis, Rainy River and Red Lake all have one new case. Here in the Thunder Bay District, the health unit reported 11 new cases today. Ten of them are in the Thunder Bay area, one is in a district community, and the number of active cases rose from 63 to 65. There were 9,200 vaccines administered last week. More than 8,000 of them were booster shots, and around 900 were first doses. The vaccination rate is now over 90% of residents 12 and up with one dose, and over 80% of people aged 5 and up with two doses. Local MP Marcus Pulowski is keeping a close eye on the Omicron variant as it becomes the dominant strain for COVID cases around the globe. Pulowski has spent almost 35 years practicing as a doctor, including in Africa, and he's optimistic that this region can avoid a surge of hospitalizations based on the results seen in countries where the variant originated. If you look at South Africa, where um, they had a real large outbreak, Omicron became the dominant strain, and they did not find th that the hospitals were overflowing, that there wasn't enough ventilators, there wasn't enough oxygen. That was certainly the case with Delta. Pulowski understands the frustration felt by those who believe we were approaching the end of the pandemic, and he feels the recent spike in cases is merely a bump in the road. He also thinks the increase in availability of booster shots is, best, is the best bet to help people protected throughout the rest of the pandemic. A booster for a vaccine will give you added protection. This is just with all vaccines. So, um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's worth getting the booster. And certainly as somebody who still does medicine from time to time, I'm getting the booster. Ontario's top doctor is urging people to be cautious during the holiday season as the Omicron variant continues to fuel COVID-19. Scott Lightfoot has the latest. We are currently tracking to have more cases per day than we have ever had during the entire pandemic. The Omicron variant is now the dominant strain of COVID-19 in Ontario, says Dr. Kieran Moore, telling Ontarians that early evidence shows it is four to eight times more transmissible than the Delta variant. This variant moves quickly and we need to do the same. The current demand for COVID-19 testing is vastly overwhelming supply in Ontario. People report having to wait days to get a government appointment for a PCR test, and rapid tests are difficult to find. New direction on testing is expected from the province in the coming days. We have to anticipate that as this virus continues to double every few days, uh, which is what it wants to do, um, that we may have to put some limitations on the PCR and on the RAT and, and to be able to use RAT testing uh, for a diagnostic purpose. One of the issues, isolation guidelines for frontline health care workers, which could impact staffing levels and health care across the province. The province's chief medical officer of health says contact tracing efforts are currently being focused on hospitals, long-term care homes and shelters, and he asked Ontarians who tested positive for COVID-19 to personally inform their close contacts. If you receive a positive COVID-19 PCR test or an antigen test, please support your local public health unit and your community by considering informing individuals you've been in close contact with and asking them to isolate as well. There is some positive news, according to Dr. Moore. Only 15 of the 4,600 confirmed cases of Omicron are in hospital, and none are in the province's intensive care system. Moore thanked Ontarians for remaining patient as the province tries to get a handle on this latest pandemic surge. I know this is an anxious time. Uh, I know many are worried. Uh, we'll get through this together. We'll get you the vaccine. It may be not at the exact time you'd like, but we're doing our best at a very difficult time. Uh, and um, I personally want to thank every healthcare worker uh, that is spending their holiday time, not with their family, but 
but supporting Ontarians. A stretch of the Trans-Canada Highway between Chabaqua and Uppsala remains closed at this hour due to a serious collision. The closure began around 1.30 this afternoon and Ontario 511 is advising drivers to expect long delays. Meanwhile, a single vehicle collision south of Nipigon is also being reported. The incident near Sturgeon River Bridge is blocking the westbound lane of Highway 1117. The Superior Court has ordered the owner of the mill site in Red Rock to pay the town nearly $2 million for back taxes. River Sedge Developments acquired the property from Red Rock in 2014 with promises to clear the site and bring new development there. The court case began in March 2020 when town officials filed a claim for over $2 million against a numbered company controlled by River Sedge. Court documents acquired by Dougal Media show lawyers for the company and the town signed a document in July consenting to a superior court order for close to $1.9 million to be paid to Red Rock for taxes owed, including penalties and interest. There was no public announcement from the town and Red Rock officials won't comment. River Sedge CEO Justice Veldman confirms he has an agreement with Red Rock which allows his company to continue to work with the Ministry of the Environment to clean up the old mill property. The Fort William First Nation and the Thunder Bay Catholic District School Board are mourning the passing of a longtime bound counselor and school board trustee. Philip Peltier died on Thursday evening at the age of 61. Peltier was born and raised on the Fort William First Nation and spent 24 years on the Bound Council starting in 1994. Chief Peter Collins says the passing of his longtime colleague has affected his community deeply. Peltier was also a trustee with the Catholic School Board for over 25 years. Throughout that time, Catholic School Board Director Pino Tassone says he was instrumental in Indigenous education initiatives, especially the Ojibwe language programs, and he spoke up for equity, anti-racism, and alternative learning for all students. Both Tassone and Collins are ref reflecting on how much Peltier impacted the community. He worked hard, and uh, he's dearly going to be missed in our community. Uh, his dedication, his determination to be successful, even after he got hurt in 1985, uh, and when he got uh, paralyzed that time, it did not uh, swagger or sway him from uh, the work and dedication he had to bring a prosperity to this community. I mean, we wouldn't be where we are today in terms of Catholic education, Indigenous education. Um, he, he started our department, which will continue and we'll expand on that. And um, anytime we talk about Indigenous peoples, um, we talk about the local issues here in, in Thunder Bay, um, we will always think about him and his, his wisdom and his advice. Pelche's funeral will be held tomorrow following a prayer service this evening. He leaves behind his three daughters, their mother Evelyn, and ten grandchildren. The warmer temperatures this December have delayed the opening of Thunder Bay's outdoor rinks. The rinks are normally open in time for school kids starting their Christmas break. But with the colder weather now arriving, that disappointment is soon to change. Higher temperatures and rain set back the preparations earlier this month. And city crews also can flood the rinks when it's snowing. City Parks and Open Spaces manager Corey Halverson says they expect most of the rinks to be able to open up this Friday with hockey nets in place. Until then, crews will be clearing snow and adding more water to the ice surfaces. Around 14 sites will open up, mostly the supervised rinks and a couple that are better for flooding and freezing, with the rest opening up soon after. Halverson says as of now, the rinks won't have any capacity limit. Last year we, we saw uh, really good user rates, a lot of people were out on the rink so we anticipate that this year as well. Um, but yeah, we're going to have to keep a close eye on the changing restrictions uh, because they could have impact so we'll be watching that closely and, and users need to sort of be mindful of that and be prepared for a change. Halverson says the only restrictions will be for the change rooms as they will have to implement capacity limits for the buildings but washrooms will still be available. Well, Fiona, it was...